Welcome to Forging Plowshares, a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom of God. We hope this part of our ongoing conversation stimulates your mind and challenges your heart about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Please stay tuned at the end of the podcast for a short message about our ministry. In this podcast, we introduce the work of Trent Maxey, and Trent then gives us an insight into the role of religion and the secular, just describing the amorphous nature of religion and questioning the very notion of there being a distinctive uh, demarcation between the religious, the non-religious, the secular, the political, the economic, and in fact, uh, showing that there is a binary at work in all of these categories, that there's an interpenetration of religion with economics and politics, and that to define the term or to imagine that it is a realm apart from the social and the economic is perhaps mistaken. And in turn, to take notions of secularity and imagine that there is such a realm as being without religion or being non-religious or being free of the impulses that mark the religious, this also comes under question. Trent has written I think the definitive work on religion in Japan, The Greatest Problem, published through Harvard University Press. He's a professor at Amherst College and is then a historian of religion and a specialist on Japanese religion. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and conversations. We're going to have several uh, with Trent. Uh, If you're enjoying the work that we're doing at Forging Plowshares and you feel the need, I'm happy to talk to people, to receive calls, to receive emails. If you have ideas that you want to pursue, you'd like a community to pursue it in, think about uh, uh, linking up with Forging Plowshares. Certainly, we're looking for uh, participants both uh, in the ministry, but uh, those who might aid us financially, like us on social media. And if you feel like you benefit from these podcasts, from the work that we're doing, we encourage you to express that financially, and you can learn how to do so on our website through Outreach International. Hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Trent Maxey. Hey, Trent. Yeah, looks good. Looks good. How goes it? (laughs) All right. How's Professor Maxi? Um, suffering from the end of a sabbatical. <laughs> I, I, how long did you have off? I had two semesters. Oh wow! Wow. So now yeah. you actually have to work, huh? Yeah, I got to work for a living. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you actually call that work that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do on your uh, on your sabbatical? Uh, I did make it to Japan twice. Gave some lectures up at Hokkaido and did a a little bit of research. Um, Mostly visited colleges with Amory, it feels like. And we did a lot of that. And then it just kind of came to an end. I thought you were going to do something with cars. Still doing it. Oh, okay. Slowly, slowly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I actually, you know, I did, the the main research I did was back home. I was in Kawashima for, I don't know, two and a half weeks or something, hitting the uh, prefectural archives and so on. So kind of trying to work work on a, a chapter or an article on the privatization of the railroads and the arrival of the car and neo, neoliberalism and mobility in regional Japan. Oh, wow. That sounds broad strokes. Yeah, well, we'll see. I, I yeah. work very slowly. Well, I think you've written the authoritative text on religion in Japan. No, I mean... It, it, it's been kind of a interesting and fun conversation. I think you'd be re- you would really enjoy reading um, Jolian Thomas. He's got a book out called Faking Liberty or Faking well, Liberties. Be- he picks up with the uh, occupation and is really interested in you know kind of the question of what is religious freedom or not. And 
has some really interesting and I think well argued points about the way we think about religious freedom both in Japan but comparatively in the, in the role of the occupation and he kind of takes down some of the standard narratives and has a really smart way of thinking about what religious freedom is and isn't and has a share of controversy um in a good way I think so he's a he's a really sharp guy but tell me about this class what 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 what's what's the haps what are people interested in what are they talking about we got people from all over the world finland canada mexico united states but anyway the class is called religion and culture actually trent i probably designed this class with materials that you gave me years ago uh <laughs> I've already done a bit with kind of the ambiguity of religion in Japan. And the articles you sent were hitting it exactly. So that that is it, just defining what this thing is, how it functions, how it's manipulated. Yeah. I'm trying to do it. This course, when I first did it, I just kind of poured it on. I did everything in this class. I did yeah. I did religious theory, but I did Gerard Buddhism and, you know, Nishida, Kitaro Nishida and Heidegger. Mm. In this particular class, I'm going to do a section on the Vedas. So I never knew what text to use. I've never really known. This time yeah. we're reading David Bentley Hart's Experience of God, which sort of goes along in, in a way with what we're doing, but sometimes it doesn't. That's yeah. a vague answer, isn't it? <laughs> no, I mean, but it, it, it's a it's an interesting set of conversations, and it's vague in part because the whole point is the the term is vague, but also I think a lot of the debates hit differently depending on where you're standing. So if you're standing, you know, within a kind of religious studies context where supposedly you're having a kind of neutral descriptive analytical relationship to a body of things out there it raises different challenges and different correctives but if you're working within say you know greek orthodoxy or you know shia islam or something like that then it has its own completely different set of echoes right, right? It, right. It, it impacts different it hits different and that's the way i actually began the class talking about and you're going to have to tell me how to... Joel always laughs every time I say his name. Mercia Eliade. I think that's right. I mean, I've never... I yours, Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. She, she, maybe yeah. she just makes fun of me at everything I say. I don't know. <laughs> it can't possibly be right if my old man says it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I begin the class doing a comparison of Mercia Eliade and Peter Berger the study of religious studies and yeah. kind of a sociology of religion yeah. with that, with what you're saying in mind. Okay. Here's two very yeah. different perspectives. You might be interested. Um, one of the, the authors I've used is Tomoko Masazawa. She was at Michigan for a long time and she's got this book called the invention of world religions. Okay. I think her, I've seen it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Her first book is called in search of dream time where it's a kind of critical reading of Eliade and that kind of generation of, you know, this attempt to find and define the core of what it is to be religious. I've also, you can tell from what I said, I've, I've been a real big fan of Timothy Fitzgerald quite a bit. Um, yeah, I really liked his stuff. I liked what he did. In fact, I did a blog. I was kind of trying to get my students engaged yep. in which i took the two articles that you sent the fitzgerald article and then the john butler mm -hmm. i had never seen such a concise critique of taylor as yep. that of, of butler you could you can swing it you know we, we could look at kind of a pre-modern unit to talk about you know what is a kind of syncretic space and you know what happens when you basically have to abandon the notion of isms as kind of coherent self-contained things but there's a, a a fairly recent book that i reviewed that i really like it's by a norwegian scholar Eike rots and he it's as much a kind of ethnographic book as it is a kind of 
religious studies book, and he's interested in kind of the way Shinto in contemporary Japan has really adopted strategies to um, improve its image. And he talk, talks about the kind of the way in which it's, it's wrapping itself in ecology and neo-paganism, which are kind of global things as a way to kind of get Japanese pub, the Japanese public to feel like, oh, shrines are a place where you go and preserve forests. And what makes Shinto Shinto is its relationship to forests. Shinto nature and ideology in contemporary Japan. Um, so that's that would be that's just a very you know contemporary account, and you know has really interesting ways of thinking about you know we think of Shinto as this kind of indigenous thing when in fact it's as amorphous and unstable as anything out there, and it has to kind of the the kind of stakeholders are having to figure out ways to render it accessible and interesting to people but he doesn't make it explicit but i think the book ends with this really interesting question is once you start doing that once the stakeholders start trying to bring people in under different interests who gets to define what shinto is at that point right um you know what is authentic they're trying to celebrate authenticity but in the end whatever the authentic the authentic is um, dissipates, and it's he uses the example of this Dutch Shinto priest who has a shrine in in the Netherlands. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, and so this guy really thinks this could be a kind of global thing, and I'm like, well, at that point, you know, so if this Dutch guy is equally a participant in Shinto, then who's to say who defines it and what is it? Yeah. yeah so I mean, and I, but I think you know you could say the same. I mean, you know, it's like to to have a kind of biblical theology conversation is also to constantly have a fairly unstable relationship with what is historically and you know in a contemporary society marked as Christian. You know, your your our relationship to Christianity is always already provisional, always already kind of ill fitting and uncomfortable. To me, the upshot of all of it is just how unsuitable identity politics identity discourse is to talking about a kind of faithful relationship in the in the little blog i did you know you bring together butler and fitzgerald mm -hmm. and then you ask the question what is it that paul is concerned with is he concerned yeah. with religiosity is he concerned actually with right. believing or non-believing and of course, I, I think in a Protestant, typical Protestant understanding, we would answer that <clears throat> after Luther, oh, Paul's primarily interested in faith or not faith. Right. But of, co but of course, I think what Paul is actually, and this is very Roman 7 Zizakian, is our orientation to the law or the symbolic order. And I wonder, and I, this is a question to you, it seems like that reification or uh, substantialization isn't that identity. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're always, yeah. we're always seeking to reify, substantialize, to make the symbolic order primary. Yes. Yeah. And Paul is saying, that's not the solution. That is the human problem. Yeah. And I think it's, it, and then, you know, it goes into the self other right? The othering, you know, who's in, who's right. out. Right. And I think the kind of, you know, the, the radicalness of New Testament image is that it, it seriously destabilizes those comforting boundaries, right? To the Greeks, I was Greek, to the Gentiles, I was Gentiles. And, you know, if you follow Paul's kind of missionary posture, it is this deeply disturbing, destabilizing, well, what is the core? And he's just consistent, right? That, you know, I, I don't boast in myself. It's like, there is no I, there is no me here. And the only thing stable is Christ, right? It is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ brothers, sisters, in Christ. And beyond that, everything else is functionally um, epiphenomenal, right? It's functionally just kind of, you know, transitory. Right. He's even really like, well, all things are permitted to me, which is a really if you really if we really sit with that, it's a really kind of shocking posture in relationship to the world. Right. All things in the world are permitted to me, but I'm going to. Da, 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 da. 
and the, the worth and value of all things permissible is only gauged in terms of what it does to my relationship with. So I think it is this kind of radical, it's, it's an anti-culture, right? It's, yeah, it's, I feel yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, it's cross, it's, it's always, it has to remain counter-cultural. And I think when we could talk for hours about this, preaching to the choir about how American Christianity has essentially, you know, rendered culture a, an idol and really fuels its resentment and its fears at the kind of the, how much that idol comes under threat, right? Oh, we're in a crisis. Long in uh, the making. Long yeah. in the making. You know, I'd say, gotcha. I, I, I'm like, every time I talk to my parents, I'm like, let's not talk about this. But they always bring it up. And, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I've been complaining about this stuff since the 90s. And yeah. nobody said anything then. Nobody was doing anything then. So it's, to me, it's horse barn door. Yeah, yeah. No, for a lot of this. It is uh, the Reagan era. Oh, I mean, I, I, I'm blunt. I'm like, so, you know, in, when you were at CBS, you know, did you talk about the civil rights movement? What were, you, what were people doing around civil rights? You understand, Trent, I was steeped in this stuff. First of all, I became a Christian in Texas. Yeah. I, I went to Ozark Bible College. What you met in Japan. I was working my way out of it, but I didn't know where I was coming from and I didn't know where I was going. Yeah. In other words, I, yeah. I I had no guide in this. And and being in Japan, I guess, enabled me to kind of read my way out of the the yeah. stuff that I was steeped in. But I, I think when, you should write that. I, I I really seriously think you need to write a kind of intellectual biography. But you understand I have a hard time telling my own I don't know how it occurred exactly. I can't trace it. Did it did occur. Yeah. It did yeah. it did occur. Yeah. And by the yeah. way, you know, our conversations I think were key in all of this. And and I always felt bad. I the book, I acknowledge you in the book. And I <laughs> the publisher never sent me my you know, I they sent I have a copy. I think I got a copy. I'm pretty oh, did sure you? I have oh. one on the shelf here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I, I always felt bad that yeah. I didn't get yeah, yeah. you a copy no, of no. it because you were one of the people I thought, oh, I need to. But it did yeah. come out in uh, paperback, and it's on Kindle now. So, yeah, I think I think the copy I got was paperback. So, oh, it's okay. all good. It's all good. Yeah, because okay. you know, I get I get research funds, so I just you know. But that no, that time when you were there, and you were pointing me to Zizek, do you remember that? I always felt it's funny. My memory is that you were always there first. That you, you, no, really. I mean, you were always kind of already reading these things. And I just come in and we'd talk and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's my memory. <laughs> uh, I think I, I think yeah, you're see, being way too modest. I think you got me the book by Eric Santner. Yeah, that was a good one. I like that one. Yeah, the psychotheology of everyday life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if I had to tell, I mean it's a little bit embarrassing, you understand, because I think that there was a time. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning. Uh this is uh Jonathan Toddy, Trent. Jonathan was uh he was my last TA. He is uh, an Episcopalian priest in uh I always say Chicago. You're not actually in Chicago. I'm in Naperville, Chicago. Lane. Oh, Naperville. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, nice to see a fellow Episcopalian. Yes. There yeah. you go. Morning, we, all, we all end up there one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Everybody, Hi, everybody I know. How you doing, Tim? Uh, not too bad, thanks. You knew uh, Trent Joel is Episcopalian. Oh, I didn't know that. Jonathan, tell... Trent, about the diocese that she's in. Small diocese that are, I think what Paul is wanting me to say is they go out of their way to be progressive. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that you needed to in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> yeah, as if they needed to, that's right. <laughs> so they're a little extra in that way. But Yeah, I, I thought we called the Episcopal Church in Canada, but we called them atheists with pews. <laughs> <laughs> in some places. That's what we, we, we call the, the UCC out here, Unitarians Considering Christ. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Although every time I've met uh, Unitary, like actual, um, you know, the UU church, they all just seem to be ex-Episcopalians. 
Oh, so that's a, it's a sliding <laughs> scale, right? We have a lot of, you know, former Catholics and, you know, kind of you end up with the UCC. Yeah. Tim has had an interesting journey I because he's kind of gone through the, the you actually were trained in Mennonite schools, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did my undergraduate yeah. at Mennonite and then my postgraduate at kind of a amalgam of three different, well, there was a Mennonite, there was a, two different types of Baptists and a, uh, oh, I think it, it, be, it became a consortium, the uh, the seminary here in British Columbia. And evangelical. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Evangelical Mennonites. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have we have two we have sort of two streams of them here. There's the there's the Mennonite brethren, and then there's the general conference. And the general conference would tend to be much more, I guess, what we'd use progressive. They'd be more leaning toward doing good works, where the others would be having the right beliefs. <laughs> that's a pretty easy way to divide them up. Got it. And so Tim uh, reached a compromise. He just goes to Starbucks rather than to go to either one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, this is my church, Paul, coming here. That, me too. <laughs> me too. There you go. Uh, and Sim Simon, I always like your story. I tell your story to a lot of people. And you correct me, if you were in a church and they kind of kicked you out, they were using Sunday school material from Warrenburg, Missouri. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Well, uh, of course, I didn't know that the materials uh, came from Missouri when I uh, was first shocked by them. But uh, digging a bit, uh, I found out that the headquarters of this organization called the Child Evangelization Fellowship, I think it's called, uh, is over there in Missouri, uh, St. Louis, uh, some, somewhere near there. Yes, uh, quite horrific uh, children's teaching materials uh, that uh, heavily emphasize penal substitution and eternal damnation that had been used with my children already for five years before I, I discovered them. And uh, when I started to raise concerns about it, they were very resistant. And uh, in, in the end, uh, the pastor said that uh, he was terminating all my ministry involvement, and I was very involved in the congregation, uh, because I did not accept his vision. Um, so basically, that was our departure from that congregation. Sadly, Simon, I uh, Rob, I don't think you've met Rob is actually in Australia and a, uh, a a pastor himself. He decided he wasn't going to send his his children to his own church's Sunday school because of what they were being taught. <laughs> it's kind of scary. So, it, just a little side note there, Simon. When I was in the UK back in the, around 2011, 2012, I wanted to join a ministry working with university students. And they took me out for coffee and they told me, unless you believed in penal substitution, you can't be a part of our ministry. Like that was that was 10 years ago. Yeah, it's mm. great. And Matt. Trent, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Yeah, just I, I've literally been all around the block. I was baptized uh, as a baby, as a, Ro as a Roman Catholic. My dad was a strict five-point Calvinist. I left walked away from from all that and really lived like a life of crime for a while you know sold drugs used drugs did live the street life basically and then um our great god and savior jesus christ saved me from that um and then used paul to literally save me from um that life of crime and to teach me and to sort of disciple me and, and things like that and um eventually became eastern orthodox and currently serve as a hospice chaplain um, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Cool. Trent, Matt was my, I think, second TA. Ryan uh, uh, was my first TA. I think, isn't that right, Matt? And yes, it was very, very large shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, know if Trent knows Ryan. But yeah, and then John was, and then I believe John was right after me, right? No, John came, he, John was the last, my last. John helped me carry my books out of the office. Oh, okay. <laughs> David's a part of a very elite group uh, who has actually graduated from Plowshares Bible Institute. In addition to, you graduated from Cincinnati, too. He graduated from Cincinnati with a, a degree in church growth. A master's in church growth. A friend. master's. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did my undergrad at Great Lakes, uh, then... I really wanted to go to Emmanuel, but I couldn't. I could not get the scholarship there, 
Uh, prior to that, I went to the University of Arizona and I left there where they earned 1.67. They didn't just give that away. I earned that. <laughs> uh, I've known Paul since about 2000, maybe 17, 18. I think stumbled across your, I really stumbled across it because I was uh, very much being influenced through nonviolence and somehow your podcast popped up and I started listening to it, didn't understand the thing, but I thought, man, this guy's smart. So that's- You fooled you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still don't understand the thing. <laughs> uh, Cincinnati. Uh, we were just talking, Trent came, I had a college, a little school in Tokyo and Trent, while he was doing his research at Cornell, for his PhD dissertation, was living at my school, and he he was saying to me, "Well, you, sometime you should write down, you know, the the biography of your thought, or you know, that I, I'm coming, you know, from out of a kind of Texas." And I said, "I don't think I can. I don't, but I know that a key part of it was the conversations that I've had over most of Trent's lifetime." Because I've known him yeah. since he was he was a little kid, and then he butted into this kind of brilliant, you know, scholar, <laughs> uh, and was living there at school. And we started talking and having conversations, and among them, and we were just debating. I'm not sure. I thought he pointed me to Slavoj Zizek. He says it was the other way around. So. This history Nate may never be told, but Trent has been a huge conversation partner. At least we've journeyed together, and I think is one of the premier scholars on Japan and religion, and has written the definitive work on the role of religion in Japan, published by Harvard University Press. But I will turn it over to Trent. I think it's a bunt. I, I like to think of it's just a bunt, right? You know, made it to first base. Um, so, okay, I I don't really have a, a highly thought out approach here, but I thought I, I could just kind of start by talking a little bit about the kind of scholarly conversations that seem to kind of coalesce and inform the readings that I sent along and some of the coursework that I teach here. And I think the caveat is this is a very interdisciplinary conversation and i also find that it's a it's a conversation that has different impacts or relevancies depending on where you stand so typically you know in a in an amorous classroom i'm primarily confronting students who casually imagine themselves as having absolutely no relationship to religion Religion is something utterly other and external, and da da da. And it's my the project is to really alienate them from that assumption that these boundaries are actually far more unstable that they than they think, and that it's highly problematic of them to go about their lives imagining that there's this safe divorce between whatever it is we call religion and the rest that we think of as the rational secular space. Whereas I think if you're coming from within particular spaces like you know if we, we were having a conversation from within you know sufi islam or eastern orthodoxy the conversation about the historicity of religion as a category and the historicity of secularism it, it hits differently it provides different challenges different kinds of openings and opportunities so i think there's there's that as the kind of caveat. I don't think this is one thing for all people. I think it's a series of interlocking conversations that have different on-ramps and off-ramps, um, which is not to say it's all fuzzy, but just to kind of acknowledge that. So the other caveat is that I'm a historian by training. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. I'm a historian. And historians are pretty hard-nosed about historicizing things, that things, ideas, concepts occur in time. Um, and that one of the key moves that we make is rendering the past a foreign country, right? And therefore, ideas and terminologies are rendered foreign to us. And what what kind of opportunities does that open up? So the basic move that's really happened in the last, I'd say, about 35 years is that the 
very word, the idea of religion has been historicized, um, has been rendered foreign and alien in most contexts. So even in religious studies, increasingly, they do not, if you look at, if you, if you were to waste your time and go look at undergraduate religious studies majors, fewer and fewer of them will have a kind of single introduction to the study of religion class because they no longer have the confidence in saying, well, this is what we study. Instead, more and more of them are, you know, it's just kind of the return of the theological. So in our religious studies department here, we have a, a world scholar of Sri Lankan Theravada Buddhism, Czech. We have a scholar of medieval Islam. We have a scholar of New Testament Christianity, right? So New Testament Greek, the kind of, you know, more classical um, approach to religion and so on. And so they that's what they teach. They teach within these very specific narrow contours. And there's very little space to say, well, what does the scholar on Theravada Buddhism and the scholar on medieval Islam have in common? Well, they just happen to be in a department together, but their curriculum does not intersect. Um, so that's, I think, one of the trajectories of this conversation is that more and more scholars are uncomfortable making pronouncements about religion as a kind of generic cloud of something. Um, and that process has now begun to kind of slowly, slowly permeate and challenge other disciplines that, A, don't claim to study religion, but nonetheless very casually use religion or religious as a term within their field. So a good example is international relations, IR literature. So one of the authors you know, that I sent you, Timothy Fitzgerald, he has an excellent book where it's an entire book just on religion and international relations. And what he's really questioning is how IR uses religion as an analytic marker. So for example, you know, uh, international relations journal article may talk about the Middle East and say, well, that's religious violence. And they'll, they'll, they'll quantify the number of incidences of religious violence in the Middle East. But then they'll talk about, you know, something happening in uh, South Asia as civil violence. And the question is, well, what's the difference between religious violence and civil violence? And what Fitzgerald points out is within the kind of mode of operation for international relations and political science, they use databases. There are these several, a handful of institutions that compile quantified databases that these scholars use because they want it all to be quantified. And so he contacts these institutions that collate data. And he says, well, how do you know what's religious violence and what's not religious violence? And they, their answer is, well, we just know. It's the, it's the Supreme Court pornography answer. We just know what's religious and what's not. And Fitzgerald is going to, he just starts tugging at this and it all comes unraveling that, that it's fundamentally arbitrary what you designate as violence that is religiously motivated versus violence that's not. Because, you know, Northern Ireland is a pretty good example. Is that really Catholic Protestant? No, it's, it's strictly a political debate between British sovereignty over Irish soil. Right. That's really what it is. And, it, you know, because within the Irish Republic, there is no sectarian tension between Protestant and Catholic. They coexist just fine. Where the political issue is settled, it's not a line of contention. So very few people author articles about Northern Ireland anymore that really thinks about it as sectarian or religious violence. But somehow when we're talking about Islamic violence, there is no, oh, they can't have any political rationality. It can't have anything else. It has to be religious motivated and so on and so forth so international relations political science these disciplines are slowly again being kind of called to task for the way they mobilize these categories of religion um but it's slow going i think that's a reified conception of religion and a reified conception therefore of the secular persists um in a lot of contexts and i think the the main line of debate is really in this kind of the history of religion as being a function of colonial encounter. Because it's one thing for, say, you know, John Milbank and others in like the radical orthodoxy movement and so on to talk about, well, social theory as it emerges in Europe 
is really just a transposition of Christian theology. It holds water just fine, but the problem really globally is the way in which this European way of thinking about itself, its religion, its secularity, has been then mapped onto the rest of the world. So when Smith says, you know, religion is not a native category, he, he really means it rather literally, right? That um, if religion has to acquire a very novel and new meaning in Europe and North America, it's even more novel else, everywhere else. But if we stand in the early 21st century, everywhere else in the world has adopted this language of religion and non-religion. Um, and is therefore been remade in the image of this genealogy that Smith and others lay out. So this kind of question of global colonialism and the legacy of imperialism looms very large in this conversation. So the course that I teach is titled Religion, Empires, and Secular States, that these three things develop in, in kind of, not tandem, but in triplet, right? So one good good kind of anecdote to illustrate this process historically is if we look at Great Britain, until the middle of the 19th century, if you need, wanted to participate fully in the civic life of Britain, so for example, attend Cambridge, attend Oxford, stand for Parliament, you had to be Anglican. You could not be Catholic, you could not be Jewish, right? So there was a clear sectarian limitation on how you could be a full public citizen based on who you were religiously. Well, this changes. Parliament passes a number of acts in the you know, 1850s that get rid of this. So by the 1860s going into the 1870s, you could be Jewish. You could be a dissenting Protestant. You could be Catholic and go to Cambridge. You could go stand for Parliament and so on. And the idea of being British becomes less and less sectarian. Well, what caused this? Well, India causes this, right? So the British colonize India. And then there's this thing called the Great Mutiny in 1848. Um, and this was very difficult and troublesome for the British authorities to quell in India. And one of the things they confront is they're trying to quell this in the name of Queen Victoria, who is the queen, who is the head of the church. When the mutiny was inspired by mainly a, a kind of Muslim rumor, right, that they were using beef tallow on the cartridges and so on. So there was a kind of sectarian sensibility that fed this. And the fact that they're trying to quell this mutiny in the name of a Christian head of a church caused a bit of an embarrassment. And so the colonial authorities worked very hard to say, no, 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 we are a neutral. The law of Great Britain, and therefore the administration of the empire, is neutral towards all sectarian positions, right? Jains, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, they're all treated the same. And this need for a neutral posture on the part of colonial administration is carried back to the metropole and influences parliamentary politics and discussions of civil life in Great Britain. So the colonial space plays a lot of, um, a, a key role in understanding the way what we would think of as secularity, secularization progresses elsewhere, right? Um, so this, this is the kind of, the historian wants to make sure we talk about these ideas and concepts in context, because it really is important to understand who were the stakeholders and what happens when we begin to change the way religion is discussed and so on. So I think of the of the three pieces, I think uh, Fitzgerald is best in identifying the stakes involved in this conversation when he really is saying the separation between the kind of what we might loosely call pre-modern discussions or assumptions about what is religious and what is not and modern conceptions of the religious and the secular is really about the birth of politics and so one way to think about it is if we look at the academy today whether it's a theology faculty or a religious studies faculty what are they allowed to write about and discuss 
right? What are they allowed to publish on? What kind of conferences can they organize? What What is the kind of space in which their speech is valid? And how the you have an economics department that talks about the market. You have the sociology department that talk about society. You have the political science department that talk about politics. And these departments are in their own self-conception, what we call nomothetic, right? They, they produce general replicable rules and laws that govern the marketplace, general replicable rules that help uh, govern the way society works, general replicable rules for the way, you know, politics and government works. But there's no sense that religion is really a site for nomothetic science anymore, it's, right? It's a kind of its own closed off space. And what that, what that parallels is how in our political lives, religious speech, whatever that is, is not allowed to question or impinge on matters of economy, right? The marketplace has been rendered natural. The marketplace has been rendered immune to any kind of questioning in by terms external to its own supposed logic, if that makes sense. Right. So it's a kind of market fundamentalism. And then there's the same with the kind of social fundamentalism, where society is supposed to have its own intrinsic laws and governing forces. And any kind of anything you can happen to label as religious is invalid to comment upon and intervene in social conversations, just as it is would be invalid on talking about the marketplace, talking about politics. So the stakes of separating religion and everything else is that religion is rendered private, optional, variable, irrational, whatever it is, but everything else is therefore reified as entirely self-contained, natural, self-evident, beyond fundamental or radical critique, right? That's the kind of power stakes that evolves in a lot of different contexts from the 18th century onward. And that's what's been exported via colonialism to the rest of the world, right? So what we see is market fundamentalism in almost every corner of the world. Um, and if there isn't market fundamentalism, that part of the world is treated as backwards or benighted, right? It's not, they're not fully or legitimately part of the international order because by God, you know, they, they're going to limit the, you know, money lending and the use of, you know, um, interest rates and so on and so forth. So that's a kind of a, a really quick and dirty way to think about how, if you look at this historically, it forces you then to take an accounting of what are the stakes, what are the stakeholdings involved in understanding the way religion and its others are marked and policed right, both discursively, but also legally as well. But the, the the addendum to this is quickly to say that this separation of religion from its others was also a, a strategy for privileging, protecting re the religious, right? It was a strategy that was very actively adopted by various groups and individuals who felt threatened by industrialization and so on and so forth. So, in the case of 19th century Japan, Japanese Buddhists really latch on to this idea of religion and calling themselves religion. This was their way of saying religion has a unique role to play in society and therefore it needs to be protected um, instead of threatened by all these other forces at play. So it's as much a defensive mechanism as it is a kind of mechanism for marginalizing the religious and so on. So I think it's always useful to think about the conversation about religion and non-religion by looking at stakeholders, right? So people who explicitly adopt the position or accept the label of being religious, they have a particular relationship to this divide as opposed to people who feel like, oh, this has nothing to do with them, right? Um, so that's, and so the, the last kind of general point I wanna make is when we talk about therefore religion and culture, um, one of the consequences of this kind of modernity of religion and secularity is that it has invited us in most contexts to imagine religion and culture as a kind of uniformity that overlaps with nation states. So we're invited to mobilize politics in terms of, well, this is a 
Christian nation. India is a Hindu nation. This is an Islamic world. Whereas if we really do deep history in the world, that kind of actual descriptive or even prescriptive um, discussion of faiths and practices with governance never really occurred anywhere. Um, so South Asia was never, strictly speaking, Hindu only. Um, it was very fluid, very multiple, very syncretic. Um, and we could say the same with Christian Europe, right? Um, you know, as Butler points out, um, the, the Catholic Church is very vigorously, but also um, with limited success, swatting out a lot of heresy and heterodoxy in Europe for millennia. Um, so this idea that you can have a kind of one-to-one -one access to a society, a culture, a race, an ethnicity, by then in the singular identifying an ism, right, Confucianism or Buddhism, and that gives you a cipher to unlock that unitary culture is is pretty problematic, right? It's 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 very limiting. Um, so when I teach a survey of pre-modern Japan, we spend a lot of time talking about Buddhism, and invariably about two thirds through the semester, a student will say, I'm really confused about what Buddhism is. And I said, correct answer, um, because it, it's not one thing. Like, if you think it's one thing, it really isn't. So, you know, Buddhism is again, just a really good example because, you know, in the, in the kind of Western world, mainly Anglophone world, you know, the first strong successful impression of it, Buddhism was Zen Buddhism, right? D.T. Suzuki and this idea of, you know, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Zen was this image partially because especially Japanese Buddhists were like, what's really going to make Buddhism seem relevant, but also defensible is to emphasize that it's philosophical, right? And so Zen is philosophy. And so we're going to really popularize this notion that Buddhism is Zen. Well, if you go to most Zen temples in Japan, yes, they have meditation halls, but most Zen temples will also have an altar where they do tantric fire ceremonies. Because Japanese parishioners, Japanese Buddhists have always re really related to Buddhism most through esoteric tantric rituals, not through philosophy. It was about what the Buddhist monk can accomplish for them by conducting these tantric tantric rites, right? So the the kind of polished notion of Zen as this you know meditative philosophy does not really fit with actual practiced history and the way people related to these spaces um, and so on. And then you know Zen has been overrun now by Tibetan Buddhism, right? Tibetan Buddhism with the Dalai Lama is now the primary face of Buddhism right outside of asia and even then it's very highly sanitized so the kind of hollywood way in which Bo tibetan buddhism is thought of is very different from historical lamaism um and the you know most westerners get really uncomfortable when you point out that it, well, it was a theocracy right um and then they're like well that sounds very different because then that's religion stepping out of its proper boundaries and so on so the kind of historical way of kind of challenging the way these things are siloed and rendered neat when they're not neat is I think the heart of this kind of scholarly conversation. So I guess I was also, I was really just curious what kind of kind of questions or thoughts people had and maybe we could just kind of have a discussion rather than me just endlessly talking at people. It's all very nebulous I realize. Oh I think you brilliantly summarized it. That 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 uh that was insightful. Jim what I'm trying to reach for is to put into words the transition, the uh, bridge, or the gap that not just jo John Locke, but I'm sure there were folks and movements and ideas and writings that coalesced in that time. Um, everything was, I'll just take a chance, was turned upside down from like a universal influence of the church. I'll just say within a lifetime that was divided into church state, but yet there are still undercurrents that, that are still not resolved. Anyone put into words what a, what a transition that was. It seems like it just changed reality. So two things would be, it's it's now kind of, you know, so, you know, if we went back 50 years and we were reading, you know, college history textbooks, it really was about, well, this was the transition. This was the moment. This was when it changed. Whereas now where we're, things are very lumpy 
right? So, so you know, the, the, the batter doesn't mix thoroughly. So there's all there's no such thing as a clean break anywhere. We take that. Um, but Locke is an interesting place to to look. And again, kind of social history is, is, is a good way to overlap it, right? So there's a classic, classic book by Christopher Hill called The Century of Revolution. And he's talking about Britain kind of before and after the English Civil War and the regicide of Charles I. And he sets this book up very clearly that he describes kind of how people lived in late Tudor England, right? You know, what kind of homes they lived in, what kind of clothes they wore. And then he talks about how people lived a century later. And he points out that by a century later, it looks, we, we would recognize it, right? They had window panes, they were drinking tea, they were wearing these clothes, and so on. So he claims that, you know, this long century around this revolution, this civil war, really creates what we English speaking people especially people living on the in the British Isles would recognize as more contiguous with their lives. And one of the key elements of that century, and this is where Locke's theory matters, right? What he's arguing for, because he's not describing, he's prescribing, right? And he's arguing against people who think otherwise, right? And partially what he's saying is the point of government is strictly to safeguard property. And so one thing that's happening and what foments civil war um, in that period is enclosures. So most land throughout the British Isles were organized around a commons, right? Substantial amounts of land were commons. And the poorest members of that of those communities were able to go in for firewood, for some trapping, right? It was a kind of economic cushion. And what happens is landowners realize they can make more money by enclosing these lands, by clarifying strict ownership and farming them much more intensively. A lot of it was for um, sheep herding and wool manufacture. And so they begin to kind of strictly clarify property rights as an excuse to exclude people from the commons. And this immiserates wow. people. Right. And it creates a lot of social economic tension, but it also jumpstarts industrialization because it allows them to really extract more surplus value from the land. So Locke's argument about the secular focus of government as merely safeguarding property has to be read in relationship to these larger shifts to property and money making. So and another kind of historian's insight with some of this debate is there is clearly this embedded assumption that Europe under the Catholic Church, pre-Reformation Europe, was far more benighted and oppressive than post-Reformation Protestant Europe. And what we find if we actually look into historical archives is it's actually the converse. So one scholar looks at civil society in, in Germany kind of straddling very late 1600s through the late 1700s and looking at the way, say, for example, marriage, divorce and other kind of, you know, intimate sexual lives were policed. And in Catholic Germany where the Catholic Church retained kind of jurisdiction over these issues. It treated a lot of these problems, like out of wedlock children and things like this, with, well, what are you going to do? It's a fallen world. And it had a kind of mechanism for cushioning some of the social costs of people being caught in these circumstances, right? It was, it was about, well, you know, again, the world is fallen. Sin is everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. In Protestant Germany, these the question of marriage, child rearing, divorce, all these things become a civil matter, right? So this it becomes a, the civil authorities take over jurisdiction from the church, and they become far more punitive and intrusive. They become far more prescriptive, and really, it's 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 really night and day. So pre-Reformation Catholic Europe was probably a little more loose, right? The church was never really as tight-fisted and capable of governing daily lives of people and their economic lives even than a secular state was. So secularization ironically creates, seemingly in the language of freedom from religion, 
a lot more surveillance, a lot more control, and so on, right? Um, not to set aside from the fact that, you know, nobody, the Spanish Inquisition is pretty horrible. So this isn't giving, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church a blank check, but it is a kind of way in which the intellectual habits of the way we think about secularity, secularization, modernity creates these massive blind spots, right? These hard assumptions, right? Because a lot of this has to do with mechanisms of surveillance and control. And pre-modern states simply lacked the technology and the economic wherewithal to even care that much about how people live their lives. Communities were self-governing, right? And so on. The state just wasn't that intrusive. Whereas the modern state is an incredibly intrusive thing, or at least strives to be intrusive, right? The French state after the revolution really cares if everybody thinks they're French or not. And therefore they have schools, curricula, a uniformed military, all of these things that they use to create an incre increasingly uniform sense of what it means to be French. That just didn't exist. Peasants did not think of themselves as French um, after, pre prior to the revolution. So the conversation about when these things shift has to be a kind of full spectrum conversation of how is the economy and technology and therefore the political imperatives attached to them, how do they shift, if that makes sense. So one of the challenges to, you know, from that I put the students is you think you're free from all of this stuff because you're not religious. But in fact, I'm like, you know, I'm like heresy is policed. You know, you, you say the wrong thing in the wrong institutional space, you will be excommunicated in 2024 just as quickly as you would be excommunicated in 1554. So this idea that we're somehow outside the space of doctrinal and ritual practice mattering, um, it does. It still does. We just don't call it religion anymore. And so that's part of the issue, right? By Since it's no longer recognized as religion, it seems to kind of fall off the radar. It, it goes stealth. And, and people don't yeah. seem to feel like they can critique it or see it in the same way. People will be very quick to say, well, I don't want a Catholic bishop telling me who I can marry or can't marry because I divorced or not. I, that seems really intrusive into my personal life. I should not have to get an annulment. Right. That seems really offensive to people. But there are all kinds of other forms of control that they see. Right. I have to get a doctor's note from my therapist before I'm allowed to. Da, 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 da. So it's not as though we've escaped one form of supreme supervision and control for another. It's just the, 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 the kind of the ways in which people acquiesce to it have changed. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the Catholic Church was far less capable of enforcing things than modern state apparatuses are today or corporations we could say but corporations are probably the better example they have tremendous power over the lives of employees and everybody else trent uh, uh that's the story that i'm hearing you tell is a story about power uh and how power really functions uh in the world and i'm wondering if part of your thesis is that in some way you think that you know the state or economics have themselves begun to function or maybe always have functioned as a religion um and so that uh, it may be that that same sort of devotion to you know the 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 church has now been maybe even usurped in some way by a devotion to a particular political or social or economic order that may be in some way I guess that's kind of like my question is, is it, is it that it's in competition? I mean, you've made it clear that there's no such thing as like a monolithic sort of anything, you know, Buddhism, Christianity, orthodoxy, whatever. Um, and I, I totally agree with that. I'm just sort of wondering if that's kind of where you're, where you're headed with what you want I, to say. Possibly. I mean, so I, I, I think I, I leave it to, to others to kind of think about, again, different off ramps with this. But I think what, what I would, the way I would kind of, feel that is to say what what I think is a, a fairly generally observable consequence of these histories is that something like the market has become harder and harder to critique from the outside and is being treated more and more as a simple given, right? That That there is something out there in reality with its own physical laws called the market. 
and economics is the discipline of stu- just like you know physics finds atoms and cracks them into smaller um particles and so on there's this thing out there called the market when in fact the market was something that was historically created and has a history of choices being made to shape it and define it and that are political choices as much as they are kind of simple laws of numbers and profit and so on and so it's become harder and harder to look at that as something open to debate, critique, resistance, right? So in the North American, especially American context, and if you look at, you know, what we would loosely call American Christianity, it's sacrilege. You're 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 tarred as a kind of card-carrying godless Marxist if you raise any questions about the role of the market and and the kind of pursuit of profit over all things. Different logics are not allowed. Whereas I think, you know, coming from it from a lot of different perspectives, whether it's, you know, New Testament Christianity or, you know, um, Buddhism and so on, there are ways in which, well, there's a completely different orientation towards work and profit and community and so on. So I think that's, that's so yes, I mean, I think, I think the way you're formulating it seems that would be one way to do it, right? One way to talk about it, that it becomes its own kind of edifice. I think it's just, it's just become something that because it's been rendered natural, mm-hmm. it resists critique, right? Mm-hmm. It resists kind of, you know, maybe there's something we can choose about this. We don't have to let something like the market just claim to have its own rules. And that those rules are neutral, right? They're not neutral. I think, you know, if we approach it from a certain theological perspective, the market is a very theological thing, right? Um, yeah, it, it seems to function like a law, uh, yeah. right? And and, yeah. and that, you know, that the even, you know, we talk in terms of having faith in the market, you know, that in other words, you got to yeah. believe in this stock. And there's even sort of a religious language that's yeah. associated with it. I guess that's kind of the interesting thing of what I, what I hear you saying, because that fundamentalism, uh that sort of works whether it's in the religious sphere whether it works in the state political sphere the economic sphere the institutional sphere um to where there's this um there's this unquestioning sort of allegiance that's given as a you know it works as a given to and i do think that you're right that there's a sort of a heresy that even you know on the right or the left right to where if you if you even raise the question uh, you're 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 called into suspicion to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this these given capitalist uh, sort of laws that we live by are false, or, or 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 maybe they're not as good as what we could you know have in some other sort of system, or maybe we could uh, have checks and balances on the strongest um, sort of institutions within that exist and operate within that space, corporations and um, you know multinational conglomerates and things like that. Um, but to even do so, my point is, is that there does seem to be a real intersection in, in the sense that, well, if fundamentalism works that way in religion, and then fundamentalism also works that way politically and economically, then uh, we're talking about something here that's like a universal sort of orientation to what we might want to call the law to whatever it is that we've reified. I think yeah, that's. I think again, that's another one of my student alienations where I try to confront them. They think fundamentalism is somehow uniquely religious, and they have nothing to do with it. And I'm like, I I, I read them the statement of intellectual responsibility that the college has, and I said, this is a fundamental, right? And any deviation from this, and you'll fail the course. Um, <laughs> you know, we all have our fundamentals. So, no. Forging Plowshares is a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom by providing in-depth, transformative biblical and theological education and discipleship. If you have found this podcast valuable, please remember to share on social media. If you have questions about what you've heard, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved with Forging Plowshares or even support this ministry financially, please visit our website, forgingplowshares.org.